everybody. Welcome to the 2023 Carl Bart Conference. We're so glad that you could join us and thank you so much for taking the time to travel to Princeton. I know some of you came from a far way here, so thank you so much. My name is Kate. I am the director of the Center for Bart Studies here at Princeton. I'm just going to make some announcements um, that will be important during the conference. Um, so we are so grateful for our sponsors who have made this conference possible, um, which includes Wiffenstock and Zondervan. Some of our sponsors will be selling books uh, during the conference, and you can find those book tables in the Mackay Lounge. That is also where you can find coffee, so you'll definitely want to get over there um, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Um, so please be sure to stop by, check out all of those books that you don't have the money for. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the conference, you can always see me or you can see a member of my team. I also just want to say thank you so much to Jordan, Yanin, and Shiore. They have been incredible and they are truly what has made this conference. Uh, they have truly helped me to make this conference happen. So thank you so much to them for all of their work. I'd also like to encourage you, you have a handy facts and questions sheet in your packet. It will probably answer most of the questions that you have. So please take the time just to read through that. Um, and then if you have questions outside of that, you can always ask us. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank Hannah Reichel and Andrea White. Um, they both have led this conference and they have done so much work to get here. So thank you both for all your time, all your work. We have over 600 people who have registered for this conference. Um, more than 500 people are online from over 35 countries. So we are so um, thrilled to see how many people are, are going to be tuning in. Um, so thank you so much, and I hope you have a great time. And now I'm going to ask President w w Walton to please come up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kate. Good evening. Oh, it is a joy and a privilege and a pleasure to stand before you today, this evening. I'm Jonathan Lee Walton. I have the privilege and pleasure of serving as the eighth president of Princeton Theological Seminary. And whether I am looking at you in this room or you are joining us uh, online, we are so grateful and glad that you are here. As you gather, for what I know promises to be a transformative experience together. I just want to take a moment to highlight the remarkable commitments that define Princeton Theological Seminary, why we're here. This has long been a site, Princeton Seminary. It's long been a site of transformative learning experiences, a convening space, a dynamic learning community. Our institution thrives on the vibrancy and diversity of our faculty, comprising some of the most brilliant minds in theological education. <laughs> With impressive academic centers and institutes, we continuously seek to expand a growing number of certificates and non-degree learning opportunities, such as this conference. Moreover, our commitment to inclusivity drives us to broaden our platforms and our modalities, ensuring that the rich resources of theological education of Princeton Seminary in particular reach expanded populations of those like you, like the over 500 that are joining us from across the globe who are committed to a lifetime of learning and discovery. This can take many forms. For some learners, it's the art of preaching, such as the Joseph Engel Institute that was held here on campus last week. 
For others, it's the fine tuning of your administrative acumen or maybe developing competencies toward fostering more just and diverse workspaces. And then there are others who simply seek to mine the rich theological traditions of towering figures like Karl Barth toward identifying better ways to live out ultimate meaning and God's purpose. This is what we seek to do. This is when we're at our best here at Princeton Seminary. When we create the conditions to affirm and inform the ways that God calls us to serve by serving God's people, by serving God's communities. So as we train and contribute to the forming of faithful Christian servant, servants, join you in this work. This requires flexibility and accessibility on our part by reducing the barriers to gatherings such as this. We enrich communities across the globe, fostering a transformative impact that resonates far beyond our campus walls and these communities across the globe enrich, inform, and make us better. This, this is what it means for us to be a learning community for life. So as we gather here for this BART conference, of course, it begins tonight with this extraordinary panel, as well as so many of the extraordinary people that I see in this room tonight. I see you, Professor Lisa Powell. I see you, my dear brother, Gary Dorian. It's been a long time. I just have to say, and I would hope that you would join me in showing your love to our dear sister, Center Director Kate Dugan for her tireless efforts. <laughs> She's been nothing short of amazing. As well as this week's conveners, the incredible Professor Hannah Reichel of Princeton Theological Seminary, as well as Andrea White of Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York. So again, my friends, I extend the warmest welcome to you, to every single one of you. May this conference be a transformative learning experience for you. May this be a moment of inspiration. May this be a moment of renewed intellectual commitments and vibrancy. Thank you for being part of this journey for us. And most importantly, thank you for what you bring to this campus. Because what you bring to us makes us better. We thank God for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Walton, for these wonderful warm words of welcome and support for this endeavor that we're uh, starting here. We're so grateful for the institutional report, support that we've received. May you travel in peace. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome again to all of you here in this room and also online. Um, it's great to see you all. I look forward to this opportunity for extended conversation over these coming days. The task of theology, we've um, uh, reiterated <clears throat> in our announcement for the conference, the task of theology as Bart uh, maintained throughout his life is to talk about God. But who God is will invariably conjure up conflict with the powers that be um, in this world. Bart's positioning of theology has always been contested as too political by some, as apolitical or anti-political by others, and his concrete political commitments, as well as his concrete theological concerns, have been problematized in a variety of ways. And many of you in this room have been part of these conversations for many years. For this conference, we invited major scholars working in different fields of political theology today, working on pressing concerns from a variety of different angles and approaches. Um, and we challenged them 
to test and contest art as a resource for political theology broadly construed, to enter into a constructive and critical conversation with Bart in an open spirit. Um, so our hope is that this conference can foster new conversations on Bart uh, and on political theology, that there can be mutually enriching, um, invigorating impulses here in a generative, creative space um, for critical engagement as we explore the potential for an explicitly theological stance in the complex and difficult social and political uh, context that we all navigate. Um, we have actually been planning this conference for five years. Can you believe it, Andrea? <laughs> We've gotten some gray hairs in the meantime. <laughs> but it seems that the delay has not made the topic any less timely. Unfortunately, or maybe good for us, who knows. Um, we're living in times that strike many as apocalyptic. And in this country, I have in the last year seen increasing comparisons to the Weimar years in Germany and surges of nationalism, both in this country and in many parts of the world. And um, other things um, make it unsurprising that Bart is also... Um, not just of ongoing, but even of maybe um, increasing and renewed interest to many in these days. So we extended this, I think we start, we literally started planning this five years ago, and I think it was on the heels of Kate's and Paul Jones's wonderful um, conference on Bart and liberation theology, which I think for many of us was also a turning point, maybe in our theological journeys. Um, and we've extended this invitation to our speakers three and a half years ago. Andrea, did you want to chime in here? Sure, yeah. Um, first, uh, I'll say thank you. Um, I, I'm so grateful to our dearest, dearest friends and colleagues who've agreed to do this venture with us, some of whom may even be confused about why they've been invited <laughs> to be here. Um, and as Hannah mentioned, uh, we've, we've been brainstorming, Kate and Hannah and I, since 2018. And I remember, in fact, a year before that, I remember our first coffee conversation. So it may have even been before that. Um, but I am just so especially grateful to Hannah and to Kate and for all of the creative energy that went into uh, to making this moment happen. And um, and COVID interrupted our plans. We had a, a workshop of our scholars uh, in the summer of 2021, June 2021. And because of COVID, it wound up being a closed workshop, so it got bumped to 2023. So it's been uh, a long time in waiting. I want to I wanna just say a little bit about the, uh, I want to add to piggyback on what Hannah has already said about the rationale for the conference. I'm not so sure Karl Barth was a humble person, but, um, but I'm pretty sure that he didn't want Bardians in the world. I don't think he was trying to create Bardians. <laughs> and I, I think that um, one of the reasons we have, uh, some of us have allergic reactions to Barth because we're actually reacting to a reception history of Barth and the Bardianism. Uh, and it is an ism, right, uh, that, that we may uh, have an allergic reaction to. So in a way, the nature of this conference is anti-Bardian, and yet because it's anti-Bardian, it may just please Bart, and, uh, and maybe he's not rolling over in his grave. And I, I also say, want to suggest that we may be uh, very guilty of subjecting theology to political norms in the conversations we're about to have, which on Bart's terms leads only to counterfeit distortions of the subject matter. But it's also the case that Bart understood theological judgments to be entangled with political judgments. And as Hannah already mentioned, we've been planning this conversation since 2018. And for all the thinning thin or absent threads running from BART to current trajectories in religious and, and theological thought, we nevertheless agree, if I may be so bold to speak for Kate and Hannah and myself all at once, that BART is still a figure with which we ought to contend. 
And it's not that we want to get BART right necessarily, but rather we wish to read BART, as I like to say, outside the box, together with those who are not by name or profession dedicated BART scholars, because we agree that the questions he raised are still questions for the prevailing present. And I wonder whether this is, in the end, maybe not doing violence to Bart, but maybe actually paying him homage. So I'm particularly delighted um, that we are able to also set the tone that we wanna have. So we will have keynote lectures, we will have concurrent panel discussions, there will be robust and deep scholarship uh, of all varieties. Um, but we do also want to have a tone at this conference that is more conversational, more probing, more explorative and um, dialogical in many ways. And uh, there are some dynamics that we've put into place to um, facilitate such a spirit. Um, one of them is that we have invited people to respond to the lectures and every lecture will have a respondent from among the speakers so that we're going to kind of continue conversations that we have started a few years ago, but also invite you all into them um, this way. We have um, wonderful technical support that will also allow people to participate who are online. So we also, if you're online, very much encourage you to pitch your questions and comments, and we will attempt our best to loop you in. Um, and we have framed this conference in terms of the dynamic with two panels, or maybe today, because of the time of day, we might also call this a salon, a theological salon or something like that, um, rather than a panel discussion. Um, but the idea is to start kind of diving into some of the themes that we're going to be exploring in a more conversational mode, rather than in the strict uh, delivery of an argument uh, type thing. And uh, another aspect that we have added to our dynamic is that we have in addition to the people who are also uh, presenting formal lectures, we have two wonderful colleagues who are joining us in a special role, Dr. Ebony Marshall Terman um, from Yale Divinity School and Dr. Ted Smith from Candler, um, who have agreed to serve as conference observers and conference reporters. So they will be among us. And uh, I mean, I've, you all will have observations and reports to share, but they will more formally um, also take notes that at the end um, reflect on what they have been seeing us doing and enter into conversation with that, allowing us some sort of meta reflection together, potentially. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm already looking forward to what will undoubtedly be a particular highlight uh, in itself. But today we're opening this conversation also with a panel and I'm delighted um, to welcome and introduce some of our keynote, keynote speakers and tonight's panelists. Um, Dr. J. Cameron Carter, um, teaching at uh, Indiana University, Professor of Religious Studies and African American and African Diaspora Studies. Um, Dr. Catherine Keller, Professor of Constructive Theology at Drew University. Dr. Brandy Daniels, Assistant Professor of Theology and of Ge Gender, Women's and Sexuality Studies at Portland University. Did you just get the double appointment? Or has that always been there? Um, we should catch up more. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, Dr. Rafni Chaka, who's joining us virtually because of visa issues, unfortunately. But we're very grateful that he's especially joining us despite a, a cruel time difference <laughs> at, at this hour. Um, Professor of Ethics and Systematic Theology at the University of South Af Africa. Welcome to all of you. Great to have you here. So uh, to kick off our conversation, I just wanted um, to ask you all to introduce yourself a little bit and not the bio that we can read, but I just wanted to ask you, as we're gathered across different fields and areas of expertise, tell us a little bit um, about the concerns, commitments, and approaches that you all bring to the conversation about the political, what that means in your field, what that means in your scholarship, in your teaching, and maybe in the communities that you serve. Um, what is capturing your interest at this time and your curiosity and what form has this engagement taken in these last years in your scholarship, in your teaching, in your advocacy? Um, and maybe we can begin with Dr. Chaka to really bring you into the conversation despite the, the virtuality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> no, uh, well, it's morning here. Good, good morning, colleagues. Good morning, Hannah. Uh, it is indeed a privilege uh, for me to have journeyed with this group uh, as indicated 
so, so really my, my interest uh, in Kalbat uh, has been coming for quite some time, uh, as you guys would have known. <clears throat> uh, but Bart being the, being the kind of rather versatile uh, theologian, uh, and also the, the, the many questions with regard to whether, you know, it's political or not political, uh, has been really in South Africa received as a person that has helped uh, theology to really engage with some of the issues. <clears throat> but of course, there has not been enough conversation between Karl Barth and Black and African theology. And so uh, my, my concerns and my, my interest would really be, be you know, starting to look at some of the issues that has remained unsaid uh, in the history of reformed theology in South Africa in particular. I'm also happy, Hannah, that perhaps the fact that I'm joining this, you know, and uh, not being there is also very, very, it's also a good sign in that the kinds of issues that we wrestle with, Karl Barth, in South Africa might be different than the issues that you guys wrestle with uh, on that end of the spectrum. And so these are some of the issues that, uh, you know, I, I want to really begin to say perhaps instead of having made Bart what we have made him in South Africa, that we need to plug him uh, from time to time so that we are able to deal with those issues that for the longest time have remained on the margins of this very important conversation. And so that is the angle that I would like to maybe uh, introduce or rather deal with as I engage uh, with my paper later today. Thank you, Rothney. And yeah, I'm also, I just wanted to insert a brief comment because you've, uh, just uh, put this on the table. I'm acutely aware and almost embarrassed that we have such an American focus in terms of our speakers. They're all wonderful speakers, not embarrassed about them, but uh, by them. <laughs> I am, uh, but I am embarrassed by the fact that we have um, attendance from 35 countries all over the world and we get to hear less from their perspectives. Um, so once more, I do invite uh, the comments and I do hope that we can expand these conversations maybe at a future conference to draw that kind of um, sure. Um, sure. breadth in reception and ongoing engagement in better. Um, yeah, and thank you very much. May I pass it off, Catherine, to you? Yes, great. So your, question, your first question of the tweet you're going to pose this is really about the political in general and how, how each of us comes to that. And I came through, to it through 1970s feminism with civil rights and anti-Vietnam movements reverberating. Uh, but this was a movement politics rather than political theory or institutional channels of political work that, that pulled me into it. And my passion was uh, under all and above all uh, about feminism for about, uh, about the first decade of my adult life. And that's what did get me into theology, that there were, there were initial little feminist signals of the possibility of a transformation of a deeply patriarchal tradition into something very fresh that would bring out the best of what it had always been, but liberate it uh, from what had been oppressive. Um, and that was mixed with some odd philosophical theology from my undergrad time in, in Heidelberg. Uh, so I felt a double pressure of political theology and still do that in what political theology means. Um, it would be first of all an against uh, the need to do political theology in order to oppose especially the white Christian right uh, and its uh, in increasing uh, endangerment uh, of our shared future as uh, earth creatures uh, and of course the evident threat to democracy that Trump is incarnating and to the planetary habitat. Uh, so I wrote political theology of the earth in 2018 uh, and then facing apocalypse uh, on climate democracy and other last chances in, in 21. And these books press for a constructive political theology pitted not just against uh, reactionary readings of the creation, but also attempting to communicate uh, and to create better solidarity across a broad spectrum of Christians, especially, no doubt, liberal and progressive Christians, and hoping to keep concern 
for our little corner of the creation from always sinking, sinking into the background of other more, more vivid, more human issues than the environment uh, seems to represent. Uh, so that, that sense of, 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 of the, the pressure of the, of the Christian right, politically speaking, and the pressure to keep the, the broad left spectrum tuned ecologically uh, uh, in, in intersections with our social justice issues of race and class and sexuality in particular uh, have defined the political for me. Uh, and because it all gets going out of feminism, uh, I was probably uh, an, an anti bardian <laughs> for a lot of for most of my theological <laughs> <laughs> right so i find it really interesting uh to be here but i'll think about that a little more in the second question <laughs> thank you so much um dr carter would you do us the honors <laughs> so first of all i'm grateful for being here and i'm glad to be able to uh, be on this panel and a part of this conversation. Um, the question of political theology um, and the question of the political um, is very, very important to me these days, um, but important to me in such a way that um, the idea of the political as we know it um, as itself a theological formation has made me um, um, a bit reticent about how even the notion of the political works. Um, let me try and come at it this way. Um, increasingly, um, um, increasingly the, the category of the political um, as the way in which we narrate a relationship to the world, to try and think about justice, um, to think about our relationship to the earth and so forth has um, increasingly become suspicious to me. That is to say, um, I'm interested in the ways in which, um, you know, was the critical term, so various subaltern groups, let's put it that way, how various subaltern groups have, have tried to forge practices and ways of being with the earth that are not reducible to um, the way in which the, the category of the political want to narrate the relationship to the earth. And so to even be a bit more specific, I'm interested in how um, in, 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 the, in the framework of um, black radical traditions, um, in the framework of, um, of Afro-diasporic folks, by which I mean, but not only mean um, US Black folk. Yes, I do mean them, but I don't only mean them. Um, have tried to narrate um, ways of being with the world um, and how um, um, the, the notion of politicality as it's been given to us um, um, are, are, is in many ways inadequate to try and think through the kind of alternate ways of being with each other and being with the earth that we see coming through in various, um, um, amongst various Afro diasporic peoples. Um, one way in which this has been talked about in, in a lot of contemporary um, black thought um, as itself a modality of critical thought has been through the idea of fugitivity. And so I've been thinking mm -hmm. about, um, about how um, various people, various um, maroon people people who, who practice marinage, who um, in the conditions of dominance, settler colonial dominant, dominance, anti-black dominance, enslavement, have um, forged alternative ways of being with each other and with the earth that um, many have talked about. I'm thinking about Edward Lisson, for example, um, and talked about under the notion of marinage um, um, and practices of fugitive, fugitive communities. Can the notion of the political account for the fugitive? Mm -hmm. This is another way I'm, I'm trying to pose this. Um, and increasingly I'm saying, well, not completely. <laughs> um, it can only go so far. Um, and, and why is that? Partly because the, the idea of the political is itself forged as a part of the making of um, a, a, a kind of a world structured um, through racial capitalist domination. Now, if this is in fact the case, then we're gonna need another way to talk about what it means for us to be with each other and not simply rely on 
the, the, the tools and the concepts given to us um, through the category of, of, of politicality. I guess all I'm trying to say is increasingly my work and my thinking is, is no longer wanting to take the category of the political for granted. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I no longer want to just sort of default to it as a common sense, mm -hmm. um, be, because um, as a common sense, one must ask themselves what has been accomplished by this term. How did it become a common sense? On what conditions has it become a common sense? Um, and in, in many respects, um, you know, following the work of people like Sylvia Winter and others, um, you know, we can build a narrative. We can talk about the ways in which um, contemporary politicality, um, even notions of what we take to be um, de democracy compromised, um, but democracy nonetheless has been a part of the apparatus of an anti-Black world. So that's point number one. Um, I'm, I'm interested in putting some pressure on the way in which politicality itself works. Who must die in order for the notion of politicality as we know it to work? The second thing I'm interested in is how the, the, the project of the political um, and its inheritance, um, I was hoping that you wouldn't hear me well. <laughs> um, second thing I'm, I'm really interested in is um, what theology has to do with this? You know, how 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 has theology helped build the idea of the political? The the, fr the phrase political theology, and and again, I, I don't just even mean you know the, the the most extreme expressions of it. Maybe some sort of Schmittian idea of the polit of political theology, um, and you know how Schmidt wanted to talk about um, political theology. I mean, I mean that that's that's the easy part. Um, it's like, at least for me, it's the easy part. It's like, I'm not trying to do Schmidt. Sh Schmidt's not my strong man when I'm coming at political theology. <laughs> but rather, the, the way in which this idea of the political as, shall we say, part of the apparatus of an anti-Black world, part of the apparatus of a colonially constructed world, is indebted to the idea of the theological. That the political is a modality of the theological. And the theological is a modality of the political. So this would mean then I've got, I've got to do some new work about around theology. And that's been like really the, the horizon of my, of my own work. I'm trained as a theologian. Um, I see a contingent of people here from the University of Virginia where I did, did my graduate work. So um, I, I was trained as a, in reading BART, um, I published on BART. And I, I've been having my, and having my reckoning with Christian theology it's required me to have a certain reckoning with BART. Um, and, I'm, and I'm still doing that. Uh, I was just hanging out with my buddy, um, with Ray Carr, chopping it over, over, over food, talking about Bart. It's like, and so I, I'll get into that in my talk, whatever. But still, there's ongoing reckoning um, with Bart. So I guess, I guess what, I'm, what I'm saying, Hannah, is that, um, that the idea both of the political and the idea of the theological, I see them sutured, and I see them both as a part of the making of a colonialized, a racial capitalist world. And for those of us who are, I'll use my grandmama's language, you know, my, my grandmama was, she, she, she was that, she was that unlettered church woman that we see figured in Toni Morrison's beloved. That was my grandmother. And, but, but she was a serious Christian too. A, a Christian preacher, B3 Hammond playing Christian. Okay, so all of that's important. All of that's important. And those of you the black church know what every one of those signifiers mean. But my, my grandmother would, 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 would often say, for those of us who made Jesus our choice, that's, that was her phrase, for those of us who made Jesus our choice, then this is me coming in with my grandmother. We got to figure out how we now gonna talk about that Jesus. Because it seems to me that the discourse around which we've give, been given to talk about that Jesus, let's just call that the archival concept, concepts and conceptualities of a Western intellectual archive, are in many ways compromised. So, but my grandmother would always say, also say that just because the discourse of theology is compromised, for her, that didn't mean that her belief in Jesus was compromised. Mm -hmm. What that means then is we gotta figure out another discursive framework within which to talk about that Jesus. And it seems to me, insofar as there's gonna be a project called theology, that's the work in front of us. So I think that's 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 kind of like a short version of you know what I've been what I've been up to, and I'll, I'll give you a longer version of my talk. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, and Dr. Daniels, what are you up to? 
Yeah. Um, I have a bunch of like abstract notes in front of me, but I actually really appreciated the way that Catherine kind of brought us into the conversation of like how you came into like the political and the theological. Um, and I was kind of chuckling as I was hearing that because for me, I came into the uh, political and the theological and the connections between them in a very different way than I am now. Um, having grown up uh, in a evangelical, a particular evangelical culture, um, I grew up uh, uh, an eager teenager um, uh, fighting and passing out uh, pamphlets at doors against same-sex marriage um, and uh, sued my high school for not letting me pray at the flagpole. Um, uh, so my experience now is a bit different, um, just a little bit. Um, um, oh, sorry. Um, so my experience now, a, a little bit different, um, part of that precipitated by uh, falling in love with a woman, um, kind of does it to you a little bit, right? Um, um, and then being uh, asked to leave an evangelical school for that, um, and then down the slippery slope I go, um, and partly because of education, right? Uh, I actually being educated first at that evangelical school where my professors who all went to Claremont, which was an interesting twist. Um, yeah, 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 more on that later. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, help me see that, you know, to take the Bible seriously, maybe I couldn't take it literally in the way that I was. Um, and so on, on the one hand, that, that kind of uh, resulted in a very different kind of relationship between theolo theology and politics, the kind of flip side of that, right? And, and some of my interests, right, are, are very much in response to that background, um, for better or for worse. Um, um, thinking particularly about Christian nationalism and white Christian nationalism, um, in particular, some of the ways that, that that fascism has spread in our country and in the world, um, and what anti-fascist responses, I have in my notes here, fascism AF, not like fascism, but like fascism and anti-fascism, um, <laughs> but both would, given where the country is now, one might think of that in multiple ways, right? Um, but, but what are the theological responses? What are the theological possibilities? Um, um, and also thinking about um, politics, particularly in the last few years uh, around LGBTQ rights, right? We we know that same-sex marriage is legal well, for now, uh, TBD. Um, but, you know, in 2023, um, anti, there was over 557 anti-trans bills passed, uh, not passed, proposed, only 87 passed thus far, but 394 are still active, right? Um, uh, so what is the what is the political and theological undergirdings of those? They're often named in, in alignment with a certain politics. Um, so so what does that mean? What what do people do? What are the responses to that? How are those political? Right? What are the, the kind of theological infrastructures there? Um, but then so so that's one side of things. But then coming at it from the other side too, right? Um, what does it mean to play the game, or what does it mean to not play the game? Right? How is the game? reinforce the game, right, to, to, to put a very uh, simplistic kind of take on that, right, um, and particularly coming at this from the lens of queer theory, um, what does it mean to think about what a, a politics of refusal might look like, and I'll talk about that more um, tomorrow, um, but invested in how do we not repeat the, the ways in which power functions all the while trying to undo it. Um, and what does it mean to think about what that might look like, all the while being invested in the political things that are causing real harm to people's lives. Um, so thinking about kind of both sides of those together. Um, and I, I think the only final thing I'll say is like, what forms has that engagement taken? Um, again, the academic stuff, right? Um, but then trying to think about what, how to think about that in conversation with stuff on the ground, right? Um, being, uh, I've been involved with a number of different groups most recently um, and currently a group in Portland, Portland Interfaith Clergy Resistance, um, that go out um, that during the, the 100 plus days of Black Lives Matters protests in <coughs> Portland, we're out there every day serving as clergy witnesses um, and both as chaplains to folks who are on the ground um, and also um, uh, the folks who would stand in the front if need be. Um, so what, is it, what does it mean to um, see, see the other people who are doing that work um, and, and, and seeing the role of mediation on that front, um, I think a number of um, kind of mainstream progressive politics, particularly around uh, young adult protesting in the current day, right, all, all, the, all the media stuff about, you know, those anti-fascists, right? Um, and I heard this at my, my own pretty, I mean, I teach in Portland, right? Um, uh, but, you know, the, the kind of dominant media narrative of like, 
they're causing trouble. You know, they're all out there punching Nazis. Um, um, but but when I go and say, no, actually, I was shoved down to the ground by a police officer, right? Like, and then they're like, oh, wow, that happened to you, right? How do I think about that differently? So what is the role of like mediation of, of using one's power? And again, power is more nebulous and complicated, but how to, how to think those things together. Um, and, and, you know, I teach at a, a Catholic university. Um, we have a, a policy for uh, non-discrimination for sexual orientation, right? Um, and, and how do we think about kind of the language and what we do to support versus what we do in, in on the ground, right? Um, Notre Dame recently, my, my school is the Congregation of Holy Cross College, sister school of Notre Dame. Um, Notre Dame recently put out a Twitter, um, a Twitter, a, I don't know, my, my students would make so much fun of me, um, uh, a tweet uh, like saying, you know, we support LGBTQ students, but they don't even have sexual orientation in their non-discrimination policy. So what does that mean? Like, is that good or bad? Um, and there, there are a number of students at University of Portland trying to add gender identity to our non-discrimination policy. So trying to think of what, what does it mean to try to approach that theologically and what does it mean as a professor to try to support that work? Um, and on what theological grounds can I or can't I or should I or shouldn't I do that? Thank you all so much. I love the not only the multiplicity and intertwinement of all the pressing uh, issues that we now have gathered on the table, but also the fact that you all have already um, started complicating, not just the engagement with BART, we're not even there yet, <laughs> but the categories of the political and the theological that we have kind of framed this conversation with, I've expected nothing less of you. Um, but to, to actually get to this uh, second part maybe of the, the broader question, right? Um, so as we now have a little bit of an understanding for some of you, the kinds of questions you're asking or the kinds of approaches you're coming from, the um, if I, I, I'm curious, and I assume many people in the room are, I'm, um, if and in what capacity you have engaged BART in the past, and some of you have already started touching on that, um, but maybe to just um, expand a little bit. Um, if you have engaged with Bart's theology, why or why, if you haven't, why not, right? Um, what promise, potentials, limitations, um, dangers might engaging with him hold today? Um, yeah, there's no right or wrong answers here. We're just really curious. Um, and maybe we can start with Rothney again. Yeah, well, I've, I've engaged with the theology of Karl Barth. In fact, this exercise <clears throat> that started, as you've indicated, Hannah, about five years, has really has really been something that forced me out of the way that I have been engaging with Karl Barth. You also need to understand <clears throat> that in the South African context, <clears throat> uh, the Karl Barth that we came that we came to be introduced was a Kalbat that mostly came not directly uh, from Kalbat in that most of the Kadi at the time was not translated in English. So you so so because it was in German, uh, we we got a version of, of Kalbat that was given to us by those uh, at the time who I like to call the, the ones who control the levers of, of academic theology in South Africa. So there's 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 also that aspect as well. And then, then if you look at, at Black or African students in South Africa who engage Kalbat, they engage only the Kalbat, uh, who is this, the, you know, the red pastor of Safinville and the one who got involved with the, with the Barman Declaration. Uh, because in that, they're able to see linkages to how they could deal uh, with their own struggle in South Africa. <clears throat> The, 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 you know, what I like to say these days is that the struggle today in South Africa is the struggle over the curriculum in that what you put into the, into the curriculum, in the diet of curriculum, determines the, the outcome. I mean, for the longest time in this country, uh, the lived experiences of Black people did not matter at all. I mean, there was even, uh, you know, this suggestion that you could, you could, uh, you know, be forced this diet at the expense of your own lived experiences. And so these are the things that has recently forced me to begin to, to look and, and question whether or, or not uh, to continue in that way of engaging with, with the scholarship it helps those who come after us. So, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. I'm very excited 
uh, even, you know, you would see the title of my paper to say perhaps there come a time that we need to park that so that we are able to deal with the issues that are more urgent uh, for, our, for, our, for our communities today. And also not, not, not also uh, ignoring uh, an aspect that no one's want, no want to talk about. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, politics uh, has been seen as a big problem uh, in, in, in South African theological discourses such that if you insist on speaking of the political, you know, it's very easy for an, an impression to be created that the problem is you. Uh, yet when you look at apartheid, for instance, which was very political, that is not seen so much as, as, a polit as political. So it, it, it's questions on, on, on how do we have a conversation uh, without discounting uh, the urgency that, that, that needs to be attended to in these communities that we find ourselves. Thank you so much. I'm 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 tempted to follow up a little bit, if I may. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the the contestation of the category of the political in your context, and maybe what alternative terminologies are um, kind of more promising or like differently? So 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 the notion politics is discouraged by all means. It is seen as a as a as a bad word. It's something very bad. Something very problematic. And so people would prefer ethics, for instance instead of using politics or use ethics, stuff like that. But I have, I've come to learn that, you see, if you're going to use wrong nomenclatures to want to describe a situation, you're always going to get to the wrong conclusions. And, and so it is not our problem that the reform tradition, which has been very dominant in that it had faculties of theologies that, that only had reformed theology. It is not a problem, it is not our problem that they had elected uh, to, to see politics as a problem because my whole existence is political. It becomes very difficult for me not to want to engage in, in politics. And so, and, and that's why I also know that there are in some circles that people are saying, well, Rodney, we had so much faith in you, man. And now you are insisting to, sp to speak on a notion that has become, uh, you know, a vulgar word, a wrong word uh, in, in theology. So, so, for instance, there are people who want to argue, for instance, that the Bella Confession, uh, has got nothing to do with politics. When we know that it was a result of the racism uh, that brought it about. I mean, you still have people say, well, I don't see the politics that you're talking about. Um, and you have an accompanying letter, for instance, that soft pedals that, conf uh, that, that confession uh, because it becomes too apologetic to say, well, what we're doing is not really political. Uh, we're doing theology and it has nothing to do with the politics. And that is why I insist this time that we have to speak about race and racism because it is a reality that we live in. We have to speak about race and racism because in the academic space, these are still the things that, that make sure that a particular voice is a dominant voice uh, at the expense of other voices. Thank you so much. Um, maybe we can uh, vary the order slightly now because I remember the contestation of the category here as well. And I wonder whether you wanted to uh, piggyback or or chime in at this point, even as we also asked a broader question about part. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess perhaps. Um, yeah, so I wrote this essay um, man, a few years ago um, called An Unlikely Convergence, Karl Bart, W.E.B. Du, du Bois and the Problem of the Imperial Godman, in which I turn to um, the Bart who's called the Red Pastor, the early, very early Bart. That Bart coupled with the Bart, uh, the Rummer Brief one and two, first edition and second edition, in order to read a Bart who was on the verge or on the brink of addressing the structure of the political, particularly as a structure of coloniality. I say on the brink because I sort of made the argument that he was, as I said, on the verge, just about there at the threshold, but that in fact, um, if, if Bart was read with a contemporary of his, who it turns out that there's no evidence that they actually met each other, but they were at Berlin at the same time. When Bart was training um, in theology at Berlin, Du Bois is there um, training um, doing, doing a degree basically in political economy that was um, working with, it was a complement to 
the PhD that he was doing at, um, at Harvard in history. Um, and he worked with um, a guy named Schmirler. Um, and these were people that, you know, this, this was Bart. Bart was there too at the same time. And um, I, I argued in this piece that if, if Bart were to be thought with this contemporary who also published a key text that tried to give a reading of the shifts in political and religious, the geopolitical as geotheological dynamics of the modern world at the turn of the 20th century, namely Du Bois, if they were read together, then actually Bart's kind of um, red pastor sensibility, his kind of political critique of the, of the political, his critique of Western politicality would have actually crossed that threshold. He would have been pushed to deal with um, race as a structuring political dynamic, as well as coloniality as a structuring political dynamic of capital. Um, and so I basically staged a convergence between these two thinkers based on this, this interesting, almost like shadow history between the two. Um, I, I, I like what I did in that piece. <laughs> um, I, I stand by what I did in that piece. But in many respects, I almost want to push it a little further because there's, there's, a, there's a sense in which um, for what Bart was doing, I, I, I celebrate it. I celebrate what he was doing. But there's still a sense in which Bart's inability to sort of like almost cross the threshold to sort of forcefully deal with the structures of coloniality or Winter will say the coloniality of being that was internal to the modern world as a part of the theological dimensions of the modern world. His kind of inability to do that actually tells us something that's really important. I'm increasingly asking well, why couldn't he make that, why couldn't he make that jump? Um, and and what, what I'm increasingly doing is, and, and I couldn't help but listen to Rothney's comments in light of this, and maybe I'll leave it, leave it to him to you know, tell me if I'm, if I'm hearing him right or how he would respond to this, is that increasingly I'm just wondering not if this is a, is a, is a limitation of Bart. I don't actually don't think it is. And one of the reasons why I keep thinking with Bart is one of the reasons I keep thinking with another theologian. There's two theologians I keep thinking with, even though I keep pushing back at them, is, is Bonhoeffer, right? The Bonhoeffer. Both Bart, both Bonhoeffer turn to they, they actually turn back to Christian theology and try and put it on some sort of different footing so that it can address the, 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 the structuring problems of the world. Mm -hmm. their, their move is actually to turn back to it, right? And so the name, of course, of Bart's turn back is eventually going to call it dialectical theology. But at the end of the day, it's a turn back to theology to actually mobilize it by trying to disconnect it from the structures of, you know, the structures of modern politicality. And, and they not, neither one of them will quite say this. Sometimes you get Bart kind of close, but they don't basically say it directly and forcefully and with, 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 with a directness. They, they, they won't talk about how the structures of politicality are the structures of Western politicality as mapped onto the planet now. That's the part I can't, I, I can't get them to just come out and let them say, say that, man. Just come on and say it. And so the turn to theology, the turn back to theology, often smuggles back in that unspeakable thing that, in fact, what we're talking about is a crisis of the West. And so another way to put this is, is that the turn back to theology almost becomes a melancholic turn. It becomes a turn in the interest of trying to save the West by mobilizing what they believe are its deepest internal resources that can actually affect the kind of soteriological um, um, redemptive move for the West itself. It becomes a gesture to save the West. And so increasingly when I'm asking the question, why can't they make that move back? And I think it's now, in, in, I'm increasingly trying to make the argument. Y'all tell me what y'all think about it. You'll hear it in the paper, longer paper, um, in a couple of days. But I'm, I'm increasingly saying that in some sense, you know, the, the will towards a certain kind of saving of the West, that's what needs to be released. Precisely that gesture right there. That's what needs to be released. And, and when I say I'm trying to put pressure on politicality itself, the structure of modern politicality is constituted in such a way to carry forward that soteriological gesture. In other words, Modern politicality 
is itself, one might say, the non-Christian name for the Christian gesture to save the West, which is to say to save itself. And that very move right there is what I want to keep my finger on. And, it, and I always say to people, I'm always going to be my grandmother's grandson. Every time I do my work and work these arguments out, I hear this woman on my shoulder saying, now, what you saying? <laughs> I always hear her saying this. I say, Grandmama, I, I think I'm trying to think with you, actually. I hope I am. But I keep trying to say, how is it that the figure of Jesus keeps getting roped back into the Project of the West? Why does that keep happening in different ways, in different modalities? Why does it work? Increasingly, I'm now looking at how theology itself works as a discursive structure, not just as a dogmatic structure. Theological seminaries and theological institutions and divinity schools have historically been constituted to think about the structures of theology as an internal discourse. Even Bart will say this, right? It, it's church dogmatics. The church does theology as a critical reflection upon itself and its commitment to Jesus Christ. It's like, okay, I got that. That's, that's one modality of doing theology. There's another side to theology too. How does it work as a discursive structuring of the world in doing its dogmatic work. And this is where I think, you know, I was just, the black radical tradition as a practice of critical thought, as a practice of critical theory, this is where it does its work. And this is why I keep turning back to, 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 to Du Bois is just one example, because I think he puts the, he, as a contemporary of Bart, he's, he's like, I got all of the, I got the moves you make in Bart. I mean, not that he knew Bart. I'm, I'm sort of being the mediator between them, right? So <laughs> allow, allow me a little bit of space here. He's got the he's got the theological move down. He said, I see the, in, the internal logic of theology, but then he's saying, but let's back up for just a second and ask the question about how does that internal logic work as a part of the discursive structuring of the thing that, for example, the Afro pessimists will call the world, the thing that Zakia um, Zakia Jackson will call the world as such. How is the thing called world constituted? What if world is a discursive imposition upon earth? What if we need to make a distinction between earth and world? And the thing that's imposed upon the earth towards its ecological devastation has been this kind of discursively theologically constituted thing called world. And what if internal to Christianity's Western archival grammar, the discourse called creation is a discursive meditation on the thing called world rather than the thing called earth. What if a person like Charles Long with the, with the, 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 he's building out and filling out of this term called the imagination of matter is an attempt to get at earth before and in excess of the thing called world. What if the messianism of Jesus Christ is a messianism working in relationship to a thing called world, not the matter of the earth. So these, these are all questions I'm trying to get after. And when, when I say I'm trying to think about the problem of the political is I'm trying to think of politicality as a part of the apparatus of world, not the thing called earth. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think you've also given us some nice segues to Catherine Keller's work. Um, I remember just this is a, uh, this disclosure. I've uh, had a course here on the farm and area taught a course, and we read your doctrine of creation <laughs> alongside with Bart's. And I mean, your critique of Bart, and and then um, your very gracious critique of Bart, and then your work. And it was it was a very vibrant conversation. So I'm yeah. Thank you. I, I, I'm vibrating now, <laughs> but it's a, it's a vibration that really wants to go into a little monastic cave and meditate for a while. <laughs> uh, but I'll extrovert here for a few moments. Yeah, it's very tempting to follow you into, into the earth and get free of world because world has become captive. Uh, to this kind of politics of, of the West in, in ways that allow us to create all kinds of worlds within worlds, but all embedded in, in, this, 
in, in this power dynamic that organizes itself in, in recognizable modes of hierarchical politics, often disguised as democracy. So, yeah, I do think, though, the earth needs to nest <clears throat> in, yes, the creation, and yet that term needs constant translation. <clears throat> so I've gotten, uh, you know, on my way through a, a notion of, of cosmos and cosmology <clears throat> so that so that one is reflecting on the shared materiality of earth with all of, of the creation known as, as cosmos, universe, multiverse. Uh, and I think a kind of liveliness uh, then circulates between earth with its stunning variety of life forms and cosmos, which is which is out there with a, a mysterious, uh, <laughs> luminous darkness. So I, yeah. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm I'm detouring a little bit, but it's it's an early movement for me into cosmology and a very earth grounded cosmology at that that sealed me against conversations with uh, with Bardians. So I'm I'm kind of glad that, that we're now all anti-Bardian. Uh, and I think that's already beginning to heal me of my anti-Bart. And I, <laughs> I have to say that, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not here. I haven't been invited here because I have recognized meaningfully, really, the potentiality of a broad political solidarity with Bart. I don't think I get credit for that. But I do think, uh, I do think that perhaps even because of this invitation, I find myself already recognizing the potentiality uh, for that solidarity of, of uh, a great mass of us uh, theological folk uh, with Bart and uh, with those who uh, who read Bart very uh, seriously and lovingly, even if they maybe shouldn't be called Bardians. So something's going on for me that perhaps has politically promising meaning in politics, getting freed up from its its capture by the, <laughs> the known and knowing Western world then uh, becomes... Uh, becomes earthier. Uh, what's happening for me is healing because it allows me to go back to that point, I mean, which is early, uh, where I got shut down from any, any capacity for se much serious interest in BART. I mean, I'd already, as a teenager uh, in Heidelberg, been turned off by the language of father, son, lord, lord, lord. And then when I went on in theology, it was as a feminist and all that lord, lord, father, son. Uh, was, you know, definitely uh, creating uh, creating some of that allergic reaction. Uh, but I was always someone who was capable of thinking differently in relation to my own prejudicial reactions. But what happened? I found myself in my twenties in a, in a reformed seminary uh, in which the two Bart lovers found me completely unacceptable. Uh, and, you know, and I was young and they were very potent professors who would go on uh, to more known seminaries, uh, you know, one in Christian social ethics and one in Old Testament. Uh, and they, um, they, they really were trying to communicate to, even to the pastor whom I was working for, who was, who was saying, it's amazing, uh, how promising she is as a minister. And they were saying, no, she is not of the church. Uh, and he came to warn me, this pastor, uh, that his friends, these professors, were, uh, were presuming now that I was, I was not of the church. And this was all accompanied with a kind of Bartianism. You know, but there was another professor there uh, who who seemed to think I had some potential, 
in spite of my odd, slightly German accent and utterly, utterly chaotic uh, background. Um, and this one introduced me to Paul Tillich and to Whitehead and process theology. And that pathway was uh, salvific for me, I was appreciative of, of my burgeoning uh, feminist uh, Christianity. And, and so I went on to study with John Cobb at, at Claremont. Uh, and, and that's a track into theological cosmology that at Claremont wasn't ever involved in polemics against Bart because John Cobb doesn't waste time with polemics. I was interested in, in con constructing this uh, philosophical theology in ways that, is, that increasingly were fully committed to economic social and, and uh, ecological uh, justice. And then he's the one who pushed me when I sort of went to beg it to see if I could do maybe a chapter of my dissertation on feminism. I said, Catherine, I assume you're going to do a, a, a dissertation on feminism, feminist theology. Uh, so I, I just have been on that pathway uh, that has been, been very meaningful for me. And my creation book from Face of the Deep from 2003 does have that chapter on, on Bart. And I remember it as a terribly polemical chapter, you know, kind of attacking the anthropocentrism of Bart's creation theology. But I went back to it in preparation for this conference, and you're right, it's strangely respectful. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Something, something odd is going on in this anti Bartianism. Uh, and I found that then this, this chapter I'd written did help, help open up for me the path that I, I found myself uh, drawn into uh, now, uh, which I'll just share in my paper. I don't want to uh, give, give that away. But, <laughs> but I, do, I, I do think that, uh, that at this point, it's precisely strong differences uh, from Bart that in the face of a certain extraordinary breakthroughs that I also recognize and in the face of his extraordinary influence on so many people <laughs> who were crucial in my life as a theologian, some of them here, uh, in, in, in the light of, of, of those forces I have felt uh, that it, it's time that I get on board uh, with understanding uh, how Bart can be part of the answer, not uncritically, but part of the answer to the anti-democratic and anti-ecological politics of our time, and particularly part of the answer when it has to, uh, to confront the deep Christian civilizational patterns as they keep playing themselves out. Uh, and to answer those, I think, need strong Christian alternatives, and some of them need to be couched in language that's, that's recognizably uh, Christian to people growing through, but still within, quite conservative Christian traditions. And if we can't reach them, you know, forget about it. <laughs> I mean, that I, I literally don't know what I'm doing. I always do reach a lot of those, but uh, you know, it's what you do as a seminary professor. You have a lot of more conservative students and you find how to connect with them. But it seems to me that the, the very struggle with uh, understanding the importance of Bart's influence among so much of the, 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 the progressive theological uh, dimensions of the social justice movements that I care about, that part that understanding that is, is really key to these solidarities. The need for strong Christian alternatives means sometimes dipping into a language uh, that's much more traditional uh, than process theology. Process theology works pretty well uh, with a certain swath of the public. It, it helps keep a lot of people from just dumping Christianity. Uh, and I think that the the use of art work very differently. It helps helps people uh, to transform their Christianity uh, more vibrantly. 
uh, into uh, an enlivening force in in the very ways that I most <laughs> care about in terms of of the the liveliness of our existence together here <laughs> as humans and all kinds of other creatures on the earth. Uh, this needs strong uh, Christian alternatives that can enter into deeply traditional language. And I just um, want to be, because of my very animosity for so long, to Karl Barth, I, I want to be more of a of a bridge than an inhibition in in that kind of creative solidarity, which I think is being being brewed here <laughs> very intentionally. Strong Christian alternatives, traditional language. Dr. Daniels, what do you say? <laughs> do you refuse at all? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think. The ordering has worked out really well because I feel like connections between both. Um, but I, interestingly, my uh, first foray into, oh, am I not close enough? Sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, my first foray into BART really was through this guy right here. Uh -huh, I saw your fall. Um, <laughs> but like, you all just heard him, right? Like, this was a very, you know, Dr. Carter was my professor when I was in my MDiv, right? Um, uh, not exactly like Bardian in the traditional, and, and maybe more Bardian then, and in the, in the, this, sure. but this like, so my foray into Bart was this kind of like both and, right? Like here's the problems, but here's how you can use it, right? The, the, you know, like we weren't back to the like smuggling back in, we were to the like, but here's the alternative, right? Like, mm -hmm. so, so I haven't engaged Bart much in my work, right? But had a more of a openness, you know, and then I, I started my PhD and took my like first doctoral seminar where we were like reading you know, part on the doctrine of God. And I was like, what am I doing? Like, where, what? Like, this isn't how I learned this stuff, right? Like, it was a very different approach. Um, so I was like, I'll let the guardians do that and move on to other stuff, right? Um, um, but have always, was was formed, was trained into that kind of both and, that always questioning, but always using and always questioning and always using, right? And I, I think some of the things that I find interesting for Barter, I'm excited to explore, is this kind of question of formation, um, on, on both a meta level, right? Like, how are we using BART? What are we doing? There? What's happening there? That world making. Um, um, and and who is the we that's doing it? And what does that mean? Um, and, and how does uh, BART um, and people who use BART configure that we? And I'll, I'll say a lot more about that tomorrow. Um, but, but I think one of the things that stands out for me there is particularly some of the things I found useful recently is... Um, some of Bart's, and, and I think this is interesting, I, I want to talk to you later about Stephen Best, um, none like us, and again, how, the we, the melancholic, right? Um, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, I think there's interesting, like, over, yeah. Um, but, like, particularly in thinking about formation and how we think about identity, whatever the heck that means, that's that's a to be unpacked. Um, um, but but how we identify, I guess, um, and, and if there's usefulness in Bart there and how we think about formation, I'm... I'm one line, basically, I also took this question as an invitation of like what I could it fit into what I'm talking about tomorrow. Um, <laughs> what are other things I want to kind of throw out there? Um, but uh, in in the Christian in society, which again, I'll talk about tomorrow, uh, the Tom Bach lecture, um, Bart says at one point, truly between the Christ and us in the world, um, it is not simply a matter of opening the floodgates and allowing the waiting water to flow over the thirsty land. Readily available are the combinations like Christian socialist, evangelical socialist, religious socialist. But it is well worth considering whether the hyphens we boldly draw are not dangerous short circuits. Um, again, how do we think of like multiplicity of identity or multiplicity of ways of being in the world? Um, and what are the ways in which Christian identity, uh, right, Bart's, Bart's going to ask there, I think, um, kind of resist that togetherness or short circuit it? Um, uh, one, one, um, I can't pronounce his last name, so I'll just, some, some dude talking about Bart in the 1980s. Um, but he said, uh, per, perhaps the most shocking bit of Bart's Tombach lectures, as well as one of the, as the first edition of the Romer Brief, was that he developed a theological argument prefer, for preferring atheistic social democracy to the hyphenated synthesis, uh, to the hyphenated synthesis of Christian socialism, right? Um, and I, I think about what does that mean for how we think politically? 
And then what does that mean for like how we think about our own subjects are constituted or deconstituted or unconstituted, right? How And how does Christianity figure into that, right? Um, uh, I, I engage with a lot of thinkers who want to think um, Christian formation, Christian identity in conversation with other forms of kind of social difference or identity, right? And how those might work together, right? Putting, um, um, putting someone like Judith Butler, a gender theorist, in conversation with, you know, pseudo Dionysius, Dionysius and seeing how they go together. <laughs> um, um, but, but I wonder um, how kind of the Christianity kind of resists that, right? And, and kind of what, like, is there some possibility for a kind of like, um, a, like anonymous Christianity, but in like an intersubjective sense, right? Uh, and in a political sense, right? How do we think about like how we exist in the world, that it's that it's marked by a, a kind of Christianness, but a Christianness that seeks to always undo itself or can never be grasped or appropriated. And I, I, I the, that question of the we is something I think is really interesting in thinking with this like world making and how do we use it in, yeah. Those are some thoughts. I know. Yeah, thank you all. Um, and we are already very curious about uh, the longer versions of some of the arguments that you're going to make. Um, we're almost at time. I was going to ask you, a, a last question, I was going to ask you, um, what if anything surprised you when we got together for our workshop and started getting into conversation with one another? Or alternatively, if that feels too, like that was a safe space, we were just among us. Um, what curiosity do you have for the coming days? So, but we only have five minutes. So if you want to volunteer something in like one minute or less, then you're welcome. Otherwise you can also share over beers later. Um, yeah, anything that surprised you as we started conversing and or a curiosity you have for the coming days? And I'll just leave this open. What surprised me? <laughs> you do have to use my what surprised me, I, I've already mentioned, and it gives me a trail in my paper, and it seems so untheological, indeed unintellectual at a certain level, uh, it's relational. Uh, it's that how many people I'm in meaningful relationship to, if scholars, as colleagues, as friends, have been so significantly influenced by Bart. And I think I didn't let that really come into my consciousness until, until the workshop that started to dawn on me. I think I always just understood them as, you know, having had to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they, they, but, they, but they, they've been up growing it very nicely or they're using it strategically. You know, I just kept, kept that, that pervasiveness of, of the kind of Bart dimension in the world of, you know, theologians, I depend upon uh, in multiple ways. So that that has that's that's something that I've been able to now uh, let through with with honesty. Finally, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a strange. I think in my paper I'll bring out a couple of of actual points in Karl Barth uh, <laughs> that have surprised me too. But. I'm working with, but I'll save those. I, oh, real, real quick. I think one of the things that I think surprised me and that, that I've continued to like try to grapple with is kind of the groundedness of, of all our different groundedness. I was like abyssal groundedness or horizontal, like reaching for groundedness, but this like connecting BART with um, the real stuff. Not that other, not that doctrine of God isn't real stuff. Like it is. Like I'm a theologian. Um, but but uh, the the kind of and, and you know, far in the political, duh, right? Like, but but the ways in which kind of grappling with um, the usefulness and the limits and the usefulness and the limits and the, the back and forth there, um, in relation to like how we view, how we understand, and how we exist in on the earth world, uh, right, uh, in, in the social, in the political. Um, I'm struck by just kind of that that's been in many of the conversations I've been in in different circles about BART, right, it tends to not hit on those same levels. So it's been kind of cool to be a part of a different conversation. Yeah, for me, um, yeah, one thing, Hannah, that um, struck me when we met before is why am I here? 
you know? And I mean that, um, I mean, I've been, I'm, I'm still on and have been of late in a really just trying to understand my own relationship to theology. It's almost like, it's like I almost like know too much now. It's like, I was like, it's like, I understand. I mean, and there's always more places to grow. I don't say like I know it is like there's nothing else else to learn. I'm not making that kind of claim at all. But it's like, it's like I've gotten to a point now where it's like I understand how the internal logic of the Christian machine works. I mean, like I, I, I mean, I like taught theology 101 type of thing, right? It's like you you know how that machine works. And you know what that machine has done. It's like, and yet. There's a community to which I feel myself accountable on some level that still uses that language. Which makes Jesus their choice. choice. It's like, <laughs> I mean, some people, you know, and, and you know, no judgment. Some people can just make the move and just say, well, look, I'm gonna toss the whole thing overboard. And it's like, I get that gesture, but then I'm like, wait a minute, there's these people like my grandmother who who they use this language. And I don't just use my grandmother as some sort of folk signifier, right? Um, we're often, you know, like in the academy. I mean, I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Joseph Winter. We went to dinner and we were chatting it up. And Joe said something to me. And I stopped him. I said, man, you just said something right there. I said, let me, let me just process what you said. And he said, in the academy, we are comfortable, generally, with talking about black folks as figures for historical narration or for biography. We don't want to talk about them as theorists, as thinkers, as producers of thought, as alternative generators of how we might be with the, with, be, be with the earth and with each other. And when he wrote that out on me, I said, man, you just said something. And then we, then we start like counting, going through the publishing industry, all the books like, he's like, this wonderful book that just came out on King, actually. My friend Randall Jelks blurbs it. it it's, it's a fantastic book, New Biography on King, New Standards, and he books like, we, we were talking, it's like, like a book like that. It's like, we will talk about King as a historical figure, but as a thinker. So we ain't trying to do that. And what I'm interested in increasingly is, you know, what does it mean to take folks like my grandmama seriously as critical thinkers? as philosophers and when she called on jesus it was the, it was philosophically deep it was critically deep and the criticality was so deep i can put it right next to bart and it can speak back it doesn't just want to like appropriate Bart, right put a black angle on bart no it speaks back and says but wait a minute and then roll something else out and calls on Bart and the Bartians to respond. I, I think what keeps me coming back at Bart is a part of this bigger gesture around how black thought works. And that black thought, I mean, I think Du Bois is positioned in my work as this figure that constantly is saying back to Bart, but wait, this, that, and a third respond because that ain't the only way to talk about Jesus. But I want to take seriously what you said about Jesus and in taking it seriously, ask you to take this seriously too. And in that sense, maybe some other dynamic of thinking might be generated that in some sense witnesses to the fact why Jesus, you know, was appealing to people like, like my grandmother, or as they say where I'm from, my grandma and them. <laughs> And them is important. You don't say in them, you say in them like that. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm interested in, in those type of things. And I'm, I'm wondering if if that's maybe why I keep staying, staying in the conversation and why Bart, I mean, this maybe goes back to something that Mary and I with Marion and I were talking about when we were coming here on the train together. And we were talking about what, you know, what's the deal with Bart? And I was just saying, you know, and it goes to Catherine's point too, that's for, for folks who still have a discourse around Jesus, Bart is appealing on something. Bart don't want to surrender. And yet he's trying to 
he's trying to desediment that language. I'll, I'll, desediment, I'll use that word from uh, Nam Chandler. He wants to desediment the language. And I think what I keep pushing back on Bart and thereby the Christian tradition is, has the desedimentation really happened yet though? Mm. Is, it, is it recalcifying in a certain sense? And I think the emergence of a kind of, the, the kind of fascist moment we're in around the name Christian nationalism mm -hmm is telling us on some level that the desedimentation has not really happened yet. It's a recalcification, which then drives us who are committed to theology on some level to come back and say, what would a true desedimentation mean? What does it mean to thaw out Jesus from the iceberg of colonial Western domination? What does that really mean? And, and, and what does it mean to not have having surrendered what that means to Bart? but to see Bart as involved in a common project to try and figure that out. Now, all those words in the dogmatics is an experiment, trying to figure some shit out, right? Maybe. We're glad you're still here. Uh, Rosny, would you like the last word? Yes, yeah. most certainly. <laughs> and it's, by the way, it's about three o'clock in the morning now, <clears throat> but I think I'm still awake. So, so what, what I have come to appreciate really, uh, you know, with this, this group was that it is all right sometimes to pack Karl Barth. That in our context, uh, perhaps it is important to acknowledge that sometimes we can only speak of Karl Barth in inverted commas. Because you see, uh, and I say this because uh, if you have come to Karl Barth in a way that I got to Karl Barth, there is a degree of loyalty there's a degree of, of you not wanting to see, you know, what is right in front of you. I mean, for the longest time, we have forced Kalbar to speak to situations that he has never intended to speak to. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you look at some of the greatest volumes that he had written, in 1948, apartheid was crystallized. And, and, and there's always this intention of us to want to speak for Kalbar, mm -hmm. even when he intentionally show that he's a person of his time and did not comment on certain issues. So, so I, I have come to appreciate that, that sometimes there come a point that you just accept that it is all right to pause Calbert in some instances uh, because he is not speaking to the issues that you, that you think he needs to be speaking to. Thanks, Anthony.